Thank you, Alessandra. Okay, so now I'm recording. For people who are listening to this recording, um, I forgot to hit the record button. Um, you haven't missed anything. I just kind of went over what the syllabus is gonna look like the rest of the term. Um, and we're starting to talk about, actually what we're gonna talk about tonight. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about. Uh, also, am I talking too fast? Because sometimes the codec for um, Zoom like mangles your voice if you do that. Let me know if I start really breaking up, okay? All right. Uh, so the first area we're going to look at is chaotic equations. They're deterministic equations, but they have a radically sort of unpredictable output, which makes them particularly interesting for a lot of different, uh, different uh, uses and applications and models and things like that. Um, second thing I want to talk about is fractals. This was a huge area of work, uh, say about 20 years ago. Everybody thought, oh, fractals are just the greatest thing ever. Um, they're pretty cool. And we're gonna try one exercise that's a little different than what you normally do, say when you take a fractal approach. And I'll talk about what that a fractal approach is. And then the final thing we're gonna get into is Markov chains. And Markov chains turn out to be fundamental, I think. Maybe, owner, you can tell me if I'm wrong. For, for machine learning stuff, you know, there's a lot of sort of Markov chain creation and propagation. I'd say it's more of a predecessor, you know, to, um, to the whole thing, but it's not necessarily like, I mean, they're different, but like for sure, like, you know, sort of machine learning technique came out of it. Yeah, yeah. But what's bizarre, and this is actually true of a lot of like neural net um, simulations and stuff, is how actually simple they are. You know, the complexity arises in how they're all interconnected and the kind of things that can occur that you can't expect out of them. So those are the three big areas. Um, let me start with the chaotic equations, okay? And I'm going to start by introducing you to one of my favorite um, chaotic equation. Uh, let me start out, let me get my max seven going here. Yeah, oops, how did that happen? Hold on. Arg. This over here. Okay. Move this over here. Make this a little bit bigger. Sorry, guys. I'm rearranging some stuff on my screen that you can't see that hopefully will help. There we, we go. We see your screen. Do you see do you see like all your faces on my screen though? No. Okay, see, that's what you don't see. And what happens is Zoom does this great thing where they make it block these areas of the windows where you can't move them around anymore. <laughs> so that's really fun. Okay. So here we go. I'm gonna start up my max patch, okay? Okay. RT Cmix tilde. And this is Brad's typical max patch here, okay? All right, and let me see, what do I wanna do here? Um, here's what's gonna be interesting about this. Initially, we're not gonna make any sound, but I have to have the digital to analog converters running for RT CMIX to operate. Just a little known thing for you guys to kind of shovel away, all right? So let me save this in case we run into problems. Uh, yeah, I'll call this some um, pop one class. Okay, and here's the equation we're going to take a look at. Okay, let me see now. It's it's pretty simple, and it does the the thing that makes it complicated is what you do with it. Okay, let me bring up um, this thing here. Okay. And this equation is called the population equation because theoretically it simulates a population growth or something like that. It's also called the logistic map. I've seen it called that before, okay? And what it is, is a very simple equation. It's X equals R times X times one, oh, let's say 1.0, it doesn't really matter, minus X, okay? Now, there's a couple of things that are weird about this. First of all, I want to make sure everybody realizes that these stars in programming languages mean multiplication, right? I just wanted to make sure because I suddenly realized, ooh, some people may not be may not be familiar with that. Oops, I wrote this equation wrong. Okay. 
Now, here's what's weird about it. Notice that x appears on both sides of this equation. Um, what that means is that this equation is designed to be iterated, which means repeated over and over again. And what you do is you give x an initial value, like x equals 0 0.5, and you put it in the right-hand side of the equation, and you give r a value, we'll say r equals 2.0 or something like that, 2.5, okay? Then you simply calculate what that value of x is. Put that back in the equation. Do the process again. So this is basically called recursive iteration, where it just kind of goes over and over and over again. And as a result, you get some really bizarre and surprising happenings coming out of it. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and um, let's fill out our max patch here. And so I'll say x equals 0 0.5. Okay, and we'll say r. We'll say just for right now, r equals 2.5. Oh, we'll say, r, yeah, 2.5. And I'm going to do something to modify the patch for a little bit. And we're going to iterate it. We're going to say 4, i equals 0. i is less than 1,000. So we're going to iterate it or crank that equation 1,000 times. i equals i plus 1. And again, you should all be happy with this. Now it's a for loop. And what we're going to do is we're going to say x equals r times x times 1.0 minus x. OK? And then just for fun, we're going to see after doing that, what is the current value of x, OK? And just for fun, let's print out like the four next values of x, OK? For i equals 0, i is less than, say, oh, we'll just do three values, i equals i plus 1. We'll just say print. And what's going to happen as a result of that print statement is that the value for x is going to appear on our max console, OK? That's how we can get information coming out of these RTC mix scripts that we want to see. We could also use a thing called max message to make the value come out into our patch, but that's not really essential here. We're just going to do this, OK? And let's go ahead and try it out, OK? So if we hit this bang button, we should see three values of x. Yes, and look. They're not 0 0.5, they're 0 0.6. Because that r value was you know, 2.5, that modified the value of x as it went through that iteration thing. Okay. Well, let's do something fun. Let's change this patch here. And let's add a slider object, OK? Slider, OK? And we're going to make this slider object basically determine our value for r, OK? Now, I'm going to hit Command-I on this, if you don't know Max MSP, which gives me access to the characteristics of the slider. And I'm going to make the output minimum be 2.0, OK? And I'm going to make the output multiplier be 1, but the range is going to be 1.99, no, uh, 2, 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. Yeah, 1.9999. And I'm going to make it be a floating point output. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at the output of this slider. OK, I'm going to bring up a little float window thing here. OK. If I move this, it'll start at 2 and go up to 3. Oh, it went up to 4. I don't want it to go up to 4. OK. Let me go back and change this. That's what I was trying to demonstrate what not to do. Oh, range. OK, we'll say one point. 99. Okay, that should be enough. Okay, now let's see. We'll go to block my patch. Yeah, goes to 3.99. I don't want it to go to 4 because I know about this equation. And if it goes to 4, the equation will, will go to infinity and it will break our patch. Okay, I just happened to know that because I read about it. Okay, so we're going to start at 2 and we're going to th go to 3.99. And we're going to make that be our value for r. Well, how do we do that? We're going to say r instead of equal 2.5, we're going to say it equals $1. Max MSP has these dollar variables, $1, $2, $3, $4. And we're going to say that this one is going to be, we're going to prepend the message var to that thing var, oh, excuse me, var 1. OK? So that when it comes out, it's going to say var1 and then a value, OK? In fact, we can just check that for sure, OK? Let's print it out. 
Okay, so as I move this, see, look, it says var one, and it gives it a value. Var one, it gives it a value. RTC mix now knows that that dollar one is that var one. If I said var two, that would be dollar two. Okay, so now we're going to able we're going to be able to set R to different values. Okay, um, let's see what happens. Okay, so R we started out it was about two point five, and in fact, look. We're getting a, something slightly different because it's 2.497. It's not exactly 2.5. If I move this up to here, okay, we're getting some weird value 0 0.61. Okay, if I move it up to here, it'll be kind of weird. Okay, and if I move it up to here, it'll be a different value. But those values are unchanging. Now, I happen to know this equation will actually change those values. The reason they're unchanging is because I always set x equal to 0 0.5 when it comes into this thing. Now, I don't want to do that because that's always going to give me the exact same sequence of numbers. What I want to do is set that once. So I'm going to bring up a text edit object here. Text edit. And this is a this is a this is a thing that's very tricky about these chaotic equations. They're what they call sensitivity to initial conditions. So if I choose x equals 0 0.5 here, I should get a certain amount of very of uh, behavior there. Okay, um, but if I choose x equals something else, the behavior over the looking at the plot should be different. Okay, now I'm going to make a bang so I can trigger that. Okay, all righty. So now let's go back. Let's turn this on. Let's send now initially x equals 0 0.5. Oops, you know what? I connected that to the wrong thing. Oh, I'm just such a max programmer. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, I still connected it to the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, this is. Oh, ah. Please give me text. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Now I'll set x equal to 0 0.5. Then I'll set my r value. Boom. Now I'll set my r value a little bit more. Okay, now I'll set my r value a little bit more. And it's not doing what it should be. Oh, look, something weird is happening. Once we got above 3.5 for R, look, all of a sudden it's oscillating between 0.62 and 0.6554, okay? So every time I hit that, oh, it's doing something even weirder. And if I get it further, do you know what happens? It starts going into chaos. And you can't predict what the next number was going to be coming out of it. All as a result of that simple equation, okay? Uh, we can actually turn this into sound if we want to. Um, but before I do that, I want to show you what the actual plot of this looks like so you get a sense of exactly what's going on with this thing. Because this is where it really gets kind of bizarre. Um, so let me bring this up, okay? And this is an older class where I'd done, it talks about this uh, different approaches and stuff. And down here, yeah, that's it. That is actually the plot of that equation as I change r to different values. So that it goes along here. Remember we're seeing single values coming out of it? At some point, it does what it calls a bifurcation. And it actually hits two different values. And it continues to do that. And then it bifurcates again. Okay, this is also called period doubling, I think. Ben can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then it goes into these weird regimes of chaos. Okay. Um, all right. I have a very simple max patch that will kind of exhibit that, and I'll show it to you. And then I want to show you something a little bit more kind of, uh, kind of complicated. All right. Let me see if I'm making sure. I've got everything covered here. Yep. Yep. Okay. Let me show you the simple version. Okay. This is right here. Okay. Sound dot max patch. Okay. So basically you're seeing something very similar 
to what I had done before, okay? Um, the difference is that I've got a metro that's hitting that bang over and over and over again, okay? And I've also resorted to setting the X value here because the way this is gonna work, that's gonna still generate a chaotic output for us, okay? I don't wanna go into the details here, but let me go ahead and set this to something, okay? And I'll start off my metronome. Ooh. Sorry, was that too loud? It's okay. You can all hear it, right? I don't Can't. hear it. Ah, oh, that's why it wasn't too loud. Uh, that's because I need to do this. I forgot about this. Okay, I need to send my output device to the Zoom audio device. Okay, now you should hear it in just a second. You hear that? Good. It's not too loud. Is that too loud? Oh, I, I, got, my volume. I got, my, got my volume way up. Okay, here we go. So now as I change the R value, you'll hear it increase. And at I think about 3.2, I can't remember. Yeah, 3.0, that's where it bifurcates. And you're hearing two of them. And now it's going to like, it's weird because it almost reaches an octave. That's something you can hear and you can't necessarily see, okay? And then it goes into like four tones. And then it goes to, ah, chaos, ah, oh my God, it's all chaotic, everything is like chaotic, ah. Okay, so that's kind of how it works, okay? Now, I have, I'm going to give you, all, in addition to that patch, which is pretty simple, I worked up another class, in another class, a patch that's a bit more um, complicated because it also shows the, um, the, uh, the plot of it too. Let me find it. Where did I put that? Okay. Oh, shoot. There it is. Right. So this is a bit more complicated. What's happening here is that uh, I'm also sort of sending out values that I'm going to be able to plot. So if you're kind of max adept, you can kind of take a look at this and see how stupid I am about how I deal with, uh, with things. And there's something else that's happening here. I have GoScript 0, GoScript 1, and GoScript 2. Basically, those things, um, RTC mix tilde can have up to 19 individual separate scores or scripts attached to it. I wanted to show you this because this is important. Remember in the very first example I did of this where I said the text edit where I said x equals 0 0.5? Well, if I open script 0, oops, I open script 1, uh, open script zero, uh, you'll see I set x to a random value. And I also have this um, kind of doing this interesting kind of pitch look up here. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay, but this basically go script zero I hit at the beginning that initializes it. Go script one. Dang it. One. Right. Script two, where is script one? Ah, there's script one. Script one is basically the iteration of the equation, okay? And you'll see that that's happening every time I move the slider, okay? And then script two is the thing that actually puts out the sound, okay? And again, I'm using a different RTC mix instrument for this. Again, I, I'm just gonna put it out there. I'm not gonna go into it now, but it gives us a slightly different sound, a slightly different way of thinking about, you know, how we sonify these things. So if I turn on the DAC, you know, I'll set a value here, okay? I'll initialize it, and then I'll turn everything on. Okay. And now as I move R, Okay, 
So the fun thing is just by changing one value, we can get this range of really bizarre behaviors out of it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the essence of kind of chaotic equations is that you Brad, can kind um, of, yes. Uh, Deanna asks um, if, um, if she could get the link to the old class where the plot is. Yes, yes. In fact, all those old classes and everything like that, those are all linked in because there's a lot of resources on all of those older pages too. Yeah, uh, let me show you. Okay. Oh, come on. Okay, this is what the page looks like. Okay, and it's got earlier class, very early class, older class. All these classes are linked in because there's a wealth of resources there. Now, a lot of the links in the older classes to external stuff are are broken. You know, so uh, be 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 kind of aware of that. Unfortunately, and I just blitzed out one of my tabs that I didn't want to blitz out. Um, hold on a half second, guys. Well, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. Okay, so you'll be able to, you know, do 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 what you need to do to get to those older classes. Actually, I don't think I blitzed out a tab. Maybe I did. All right. Yeah. Uh, let me go back to here. I want to show you one other thing with this population equation because, uh, you know, in class, you know, I'm doing demos and I'm showing you like the stupidest sort of way of realizing this stuff, like sine waves or pluck string algorithms or something like that. But the real art in doing algorithmic work is how you decide you're going to sonify it. And I did something just to kind of, and it, it's a, again, it's not excellent, but it's, a, it's, an, it's an example of how things can change. And in fact, this max patch here is, is relying upon one aspect of this. I'm going to start this up. Now, first of all, tell me, can you hear that sound. Okay. It's not too loud. Can you hear my voice okay too? Okay, good. All right, this is something I did. I'll tell you about this in a second, but I'm going to take you to here, okay? I'm going to scroll way down here. So here we are with our stupid population model. And as I move this, we'll hear that same behavior again. Okay. But if I go down here, I have a different sonification of that very same equation. What's the difference? The first one, basically, I was sonifying it by taking, I knew the population equation produced values between zero and one. So what I did was I simply multiplied the output by a thousand. So that means that I'm going to get values from zero to a thousand. And basically I just then said wavetable, play a sine wave at that frequency. And you got that nice sine wavy sound. The second one, and what I did in the max patch that I showed you right here, is rather than having the zero to one be a direct mapping onto frequency, I let it become an index into an array of notes that I chose. So basically I'm quantizing the output of this equation to go to a particular array slot. And then I used uh, an FM instrument algorithm that had a nice little belly sound and I added some echo and reverb to it. So all of a sudden that moving the R value didn't just track it directly, but instead it allowed it to enter different regimes of how it was accessing the values in the array. 
And that's what gave it like a, a very different kind of musical flavor to it. So these are things to think about also when you start imagining, you know, what can you do with algorithmic composition? Well, there's a lot you can do. You know, you can actually have it write notes for a string quartet or something like that. A lot of people do. Anyhow, so that's, a, that's kind of that. Now, um, I want to show you a couple of other chaotic attractors, okay? And I think at this point, I'm going to go into more show and tell mode and not so much like write out the equations and have you kind of struggle through my typing up the program. Okay, but I do want to show you what's going on so that you can get a sense of, of how these things are working. The next thing is a thing called the Lorentz attractor, okay? And this one is really bizarre, okay? It's actually kind of famous. That's what the plot, a two-dimensional plot of the Lorentz attractor looks like. It's actually a three-dimensional attractor, okay? And there's something different about this than the population equation attractor that I'm going to talk about in a second. But this is what the equation for the Lorentz attractor looks like, okay? And you're going, oh, what's this dx dt? Well, that's what I did when I saw it, okay? And what's this? Well, this is basically, these are kind of like little fragments of differential equations. And they show you how much x is going to change from its previous value how much y is going to change from its previous value and how much z is going to change from its previous value. So when you code it up, what you have to do is basically take that. Also, you're going to get these values, what a, b, and c, see how they're kind of sprinkled in there? Those are the coefficients that change the way the attractor behaves, okay? What I'm doing is I'm defining a value called delta, which is how much maximum is it going to change, all right? And then I calculate the change in x, the change in y, and the change in z, and I multiply it by that delta, then I add it to x, y, and z, and then do the iteration. So x, y, and z is constantly kind of moving sequentially, depending on what the previous value was. What this does is it gives us a connected graph for the attractor. The population equation basically was scattering the notes all over when we entered into the, the chaotic realm. Um, what the Lorentz attractor does is it gives us a smoothly connected thing. And that's kind of really important for how we're able to sonify this. Um, I want to bring up uh, the, 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 let me bring up the Lorentz max patch that I did. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. Hide this. All right, all right, and yeah, let me show you the final version of it, okay? And then I'm gonna go back and show you some of the original things that led up to it, okay? This is basically, this is the final version of the Lorenz attractor. Now, what's also interesting is that, notice I said that that was a two-dimensional plot of it. The Lorenz attractor has three degrees of freedom, an X, a Y, and a Z. So basically, you can plot x against y, or x against z, or y against z, or, or whatever you want to do. So basically, I'm plotting x against z and y against z in here. And I'm getting the values coming out of this RTC mix. I am using that, um, it's down here, I think, max message to send all the stuff out, OK? And we talked about that last time. Basically, at time zero, send out all those values. And then I just you know, use those values for my little paint oval that paints little dots for me, okay? And here's my initialization up here. So let me turn this on, okay? Let me initialize it. And we're gonna watch the Lorenz attractor unfold, okay? So again, this is the final stage in that process where I was bu building the patch, okay? So you can see this is now beginning to kind of outline that dual lobe thing that we saw here. Oops, not here. We saw it there. That guy. Okay. And as it goes, it's going to outline it more and more. It sounds like Zoom is kind of 
freaking this out a little bit, so let's turn it off. Okay, um, I'm going to play you another version prior to that where I didn't use uh, mallet instruments. I used a modal bar for that. This is using an FM algorithm again. FM is a real workhorse of an algorithm, okay? So let me do this, and you can see... Okay, so I'm going to take you through how I worked that up. Okay, first of all, the very first thing I did was I made an RTC mix patch that basically just calculated the, uh, the attractor, and then it used that max message to put it out. Why? Because at that point, I didn't know the values that were going to come out of this equation. All right, so I started up, and I start this out, and there they go, and look, they're not nicely between zero and one. They're between like, you know, minus 16 and um, 3.7, you know, um, that's kind of kind of difficult because you have to kind of tame that range in order to figure out how you're going to plot it or how you're going to turn it into sound. So I did something clever. Rather than using my brain and trying to figure out the math behind this thing, I thought, I'll use my computer programming skill. And what I did was I basically took the values, sent it to this unpack object, and it gave me the maximum and the minimum for the x, the y, and the z values as I iterated it. So I did this, and pretty quickly, they kind of settled down. I was able to see, oh, so that's what I've got here. Okay, x is going from 21 to minus 19, y is going from 28 to minus 25, and Z is going from 53 to about 1, okay? So I could use those numbers then to control um, aspects of the sound. And the way I did it was not here, but... Huh. Oh, that's, I guess I was just plotting it out there, okay? Uh, yeah, that's not the sound thing. What, I, let me bring up the sound thing. Okay, I think it's right here. Yeah. No, this isn't the sound either. Ah, yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Okay. What this does, this is an RTC mix, a really handy RTC mix function called map. Basically, you give it a value, and then you give it that value's range. And I got that just by kind of scanning those maximum and minimum for the X, the Y, and the Z value. And then you give it the range you want it to go to. So if this is a range from minus 25 to 25, if it's minus 25, it'll be zero. If it's 25, it'll be 200. If it's zero, it'll be 100 because it'll take that whole range and put it into that range. And these squares happen to be 200 pixels by 200 pixels wide. So that was how I was able to get the nice plot out of it. Okay. So basically, then I could use that knowledge to go on and make the sound sort of work with FM or with the with the modal bars or whatever. Okay. So again, that's just a way of, you know, kind of negotiating what these attractors can do. All right. Now, I, I got one more attractor to show you. And then um, uh, I want to show you a great web resource for attractor equations. Um, and uh, then we'll move on from there. Uh, this last attractor, I'm not even, I've got one max patch to show you. Okay. Let me, uh, let me bring it up here in my thing and show you what it looks like. It's called the Hainan attractor. Oh, I wanted to mention one thing about the Lorentz attractor. Um, and Ben, you might, I'm sorry I keep saying Ben, 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 but this is kind of the territory I think Ben works in, okay? <laughs> um, Edward Lorenz was a meteorologist, and basically this attractor is one of the very early models, I believe, that he came up with of climate change, mm -hmm. all right? Do you know if that's true, Ben? That's what I think I've read. Yeah, I don't know how direct uh, the, a model it was. Like, yeah. Leaf may know. Leaf, do you know? Oh, yeah, I forgot. We have, like, other real-life scientists on here, too. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're hidden in your yeah. system. Yeah, it's like a parameterization of the atmosphere. Sorry, Leaf, I didn't hear that. 
like it's like a parameterization of convection in the atmosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And here's here's the thing that I think is just kind of chilling about it, is that once you hit a particular these two lobes, once you hit a particular combination of the x, y, and the z, it flips from going from here over to here. And you know. Everybody thinks, oh, climate change is going to get a little warmer and all of a sudden we're going to be able to grow wheat in Finland or something like that. No, if something bad happens, we're going to switch to an entirely new climate regime in the planet, which might be pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's the thing about these chaotic equations. They have these moments and points of inflection that are just like, like the, the period doubling and bifurcation of the population equation. You know, it's just, yeah. To, like ocean circulation patterns. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, the uh, what's the, the the pump in the Atlantic Ocean? The, uh, uh, yeah, the, the I forgot the name of it. You know what I'm talking. Yeah, I do. I'm blanking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, we we teach at Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, anyhow. Yeah, but that if that shuts down, we're, we're just all toast. So yeah, it's funny because you know here I am a musician, and all of a sudden I'm seeing this, and you know this is what really happens. Okay, anyhow, the last thing I want to show you is this thing called the Hainan attractor. Okay, and again, its equations are pretty simple. Okay, but there's a challenge to trying to sonify or use this attractor directly, um, and that is that the attractor doesn't go, it's not connected like the Lorentz attractor. It's more like one of the population equations where what happens in these attractors is that as you plot the equation, it will plot a point here, the plot a point here, the plot a point here, it will plot a point here. The points will fall on what they call the attractor, but they'll be scattering randomly. And if you imagine that, that's kind of tricky to figure out, how am I going to put that into sound? How am I going to use that into sound? Why don't I just use random points, you know, because that's kind of what it sounds like. And I'm going to play you a solution that I came up with to kind of sonifying the, uh, the Hanon attractor, um, where basically you're going to hear the evolution of it. And this is a max patch where I used a language built in called JavaScript. So again, I'm not going to go into it or anything like this. But what I decided to do is plot the attractor and basically scan through the plot. And basically every time it saw that a note had been plotted, it would realize that note. So here's how it worked. Okay, hit a knit here and start it out. Okay, and you can see, I'm not going to let it go much further, but you can see the outline of the hand on a tractor is now beginning to be inscribed. And what's interesting is that that outline becomes kind of a salient aspect of how the, how the musical passage is unfolding. You know, at least that's what I tell myself to believe that I'm doing something serious. Uh, um, yeah, but it is, you know, some of these attractors are going to be a little tricky in how you approach using them. And you can slot them in in any number of different ways. You know, next uh, semester when I do the Unity stuff, I definitely want to use some of this attractor thing to do some really cool sort of dynamic growth of things in, in Unity or something like that, because you can do a lot, okay? All right, now, before we leave the attractors. I want to show you, this is, this is like one of the coolest websites that I've found in teaching, okay? It's this guy, I wrote to him like years ago and said, Paul Burke, you're just like a really cool guy. He's a uh, mathematician, computer scientist based in Australia. And he basically put online a whole bunch of sort of interesting things. Okay. And if you go down here, these are his interesting things. Okay. And here's what's fun. Like, wow, look at that random attractors. That looks interesting. Let me click on it. And in fact, he's got really cool things here. But here's what's really fun. He gives you the equations for them. 
And that's just golden. That's where I got um, the values for, say, the Lorenz attractor and things like that, you know, from, from this website. So, and if you look at it, these equations aren't that hard. You know, there's just, you know, uh, squaring and addition. And then there's like these A0, A1, and A2. And he gives you those values uh, somewhere down here. He'll actually say this plot resulted from A0 being three and A1 being two and, and things like that. So you can go in and find like all kinds of bizarre things, hyper complex. What's that one? Oh, I don't know, but it's taken a while to load. There we go. Oh, that looks pretty cool. Yeah. Somewhere on here. Well, maybe that one he didn't put on. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just taking too long to load. But basically, this is a really rich kind of thing. You know, he also has, um, yeah, here's Hanon. There's a Hanon map that I did. Okay. Oh, Clifford, that's a good one. Yeah, there it is. Okay. And basically, there's where he shows you. If you set the A value, the B value, and the C value to that, you get that thing. If you set those to that, you get that thing. If you said, remember this, that sensitivity to initial conditions stuff, you know, these are, these are pretty strange things and you have access to all of them. And I'd encourage you just kind of take a look through this. And again, he also goes into um, fractals, which we're going to talk about in just a second here. Okay. Where, you know, you basically shows you the fractal equation here and the resulting plot from that equation. You know, and these are really dense and rich kind of suggestive figures here. You know, then he goes down to these things. I don't even know what some of these are. Uh, cellular automata. Yeah, we may talk about that at the very end of the night. Okay. Kita. Oh, look at that. Wow. Ooh, that's all swirly. Look at the colors. Ooh, cool. Okay. So again, I've got that linked in on the webpage. You know, uh, feel free to explore it. Uh, like I said, it's pretty cool. And uh, he's done some, done us a great favor by kind of putting all these things together. Okay. All right. So that's attractors in, in, in how much, uh, like 45 minutes. Okay. Now we're going to do fractals. All right. And some of you may have heard, or uh, many of you probably know about fractals and how they work. Um, uh, it's a very kind of simple procedure that generates really interestingly complicated forms, okay? Um, let me bring up this graphy thing again, okay? All right, and let me get rid of these guys, okay? Uh, I think I have to flatten all of them or something like that. Okay, flatten all. Yeah, now I can do this. Get rid of this. Right, okay. Uh, basically, a fractal procedure is you just take a span of something, okay? Okay, and you define what that span is. Then you define kind of a midpoint of sorts for that span here. And you wind up with two new spans. Then you take them and you divide them by that same midpoint of sorts. Then you wind up with four spans. You take them and you divide them all by that midpoint of sorts. And you do this again, recursive procedure where you descend down in and you can generate these very, very complicated kind of patterns of points. Um, you can add some randomness to it. You can do all kinds of manipulations in terms of how you're kind of doing this descent. Um, but the result is that you can wind up with very complicated things with a very simple procedure. And that's the big attraction for kind of defining fractals. Now, let me show you, do, 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 do. yeah, this is kind of a, this is one of the earlier classes I did from a long time ago. And it's talking about, you know, they used to use fractals to create artificial landscapes, you know, because they would make fractal mountains and fractal seas and fractal moons and fractal clouds and all stuff like this. And I just did a quick example here of a thing that seems called the cock snowflake curve. And basically you start out with a thing here that's called the generator. Okay. And you've got one, two, three, four spans here. The fractal procedure is you take each of those four spans and you reproduce that little bump. Then you do it again and you see you wind up with this very kind of bumpity bumpity bump. Okay. So I thought, well, heck, look at these cool mountains. 
Now, there's something I need to tell you about from my childhood um, that lent itself to kind of, you know, a fractal approach. Um, when I was in high school and through my uh, undergraduate years of college, um, every summer, my father and one of his friends and, and his son would go up and just rent a boat and go up the Winnipeg River going fishing. It was just wonderful. You know, we'd just go out and be in nature and everything like this. So we'd camp. And one of our favorite campsites across the little bay was this kind of bluff, kind of mountainy thing. And one night, um, I'd gotten some gunk on my shoe, so I went down to the boats, and I started whapping my shoe on the boat to get the gunk off. And I'd go, whap! And then you'd hear this, and you probably heard this before, the echo coming back went, Wah! like that. Whap! Wah! Because it was a fractal thing. The, the, the cliff was like, you know, divided up into like little cliffy segments, you know? So I sat down there, whack, wah, whack, wah. You know, so eventually my dad came down to, son, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and, you know, but, but this, this sound stayed with me. And I thought, wow, hey, I'm now a computer musician. I can generate a fractal boundary. Maybe I could use that to reproduce the delay pattern. So this is a little depiction of how that happens. I use the fractal approach of this Koch snowflake curve to generate a boundary like that. And that's kind of showing you know, how the sound is going to get reflected. But what you really do is you simply take the fractal and you map the time points down onto a line. And you can use those then as data for a delay instrument. And you can delay by this number of seconds, this number of seconds, this number of seconds, and this number of seconds. Okay. And let me just uh, kind of show you how I did. Again, I don't know if I want to go through the process of writing all this stuff out for you. Does that help you guys at all? To see me actually like code the thing up? Or is that just kind of annoying? I, I like I, it. You like it? Okay. Yep. All right, I'll do, I'll do a little coding here, okay? Uh, let me start out, okay? All right, first thing I wanna do is to get sound to come into this thing, okay? Uh, that's probably worth exploring anyhow. So I'm gonna say RTC makes tilde two, and I'm gonna be using a stereo instrument for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, okay? So I have to like, of course, trigger the script, okay? And I have to create a DAC so I can hear the sound. And initially, I'm going to hear it from both of these things, okay? All right. Now, I also have to get sound in. So I'm going to use an easy ADC. I'm going to use my microphone. And just to make sure I'm getting sound, let me go to audio. Bring out a little display jobby. Plug that in there. Okay, let me turn this on. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I see sound. Now, let me send that sound into RTC Mix, okay? And here's what I wanna do, okay? I'm gonna fill this in, okay? I'm gonna say RT input, this is a new thing in RTC Mix, audio. What that means is it's telling RTC Mix, you're gonna be getting some audio in there or in there, you're gonna do something with it, okay? So I'm sending that in. Now, you can also read from sound files too, which is very important, you know, once you start using samples or something like this. I'm not gonna go into that now, but uh, we'll be getting to it in a, in a future class as an example, okay? And I'm gonna use an RTC mix instrument called Dell One, which is basically just a single delay line. I'm gonna say it's gonna start at time zero and it'll skip into the input zero seconds, which means it's going to read it right away, which is what you have to do when you've got live input coming in. Then the amplitude is going to be one. The delay time we'll say is 0 0.5. And the amplitude of the delayed signal will also be one. Now, here's the way Del1 works. It puts the original sound out through the left channel. And the delayed sound, in this case by 0 0.5 seconds, will come out the right channel. Okay, let's just see if that's working, you know, to make sure that, uh, that life is good. And then we'll start thinking about how to do fractal stuff. Okay, we'll call this basic fractal. Okay, and hopefully, oh, the other thing I did was, uh, shoot, I left out a parameter here. Yeah, 
start, input, skip, output, skip. There's the amplitude, the duration. Now, I'm going to say just 999. I'm making that up. I just want it to turn on and just start processing sound. So that'll process sound for 999 seconds. I could make it 99099 or something like that if I wanted, because I'm basically going to turn it off when I'm done. Okay. So let me turn this on. And with any luck, when I hit this, hey, hey, are, are you guys, guys hearing, are the you echo? hearing the echo? You are? You are? Notice that it also shifted my voice up a little bit. That's because of the sampling rate problem with Zoom. <laughs> Can I sound like this? Yeah, hey, hey. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, that's basically slapback echo. Okay. Now, we don't care about the original sound. I'm going to use just the delayed sound coming out of this because I just want to use the delayed aspects of it. Okay. And let's, uh, let's see now. Okay. Now, I'm going to do two different ways of making this fractal procedure work. The stupid way and then the more intelligent way. Okay. Start out with the stupid way. All right. Uh, and I wrote this down. Okay. Let's say originally I'm going to have a maximum delay time of one second. Okay. And my amplitude is going to be a maximum of one. Okay. Now, other thing I forgot to mention is that in the past when we've been using wavetable and strum, remember I said the maximum amplitude was zero to 32, 768, you know, and I would type, type in something like 20,000 or something like this. That's because that was an absolute 16 bit amplitude that you're specifying. Here we are specifying a multiplier of the audio amplitude coming in. And basically by saying one, I just say, just put it out at the same volume that is coming in. Okay. So life is good. All right. So once we do that, okay, then we say delay with our delay time of one and our amplitude on the delayed signal of one. All right. Now we're going to divide, specify a thing called the division, and we'll just make it be 0 0.5, okay? Then we're going to say del 1, the next delay, is going to be equal to del times div, okay? And amp 1 is going to be equal to amp times div, okay? So we're going to have two new delays now, one that's going to be at half that delay time and an amplitude for it that's half that uh, amplitude. And then we'll say del one, okay, start at zero, read at zero, um, go for that many seconds, okay, and then original single at one, oops, I on that out. Sorry. Original single at one, then del one, then amp one, okay. Now, we need to now divide those two segments into one. So we're going to say del 2 is going to be equal to del 1 times div. And amp 2 is going to be equal to amp 1 times div. Okay? And then we're going to have del 2a is going to be equal to del 1 plus del minus del one times div. Okay, uh, basically look, at this point I'm gonna bring it up and show you the code. Um, this is insane, you know, very quickly, I'm gonna be trying to type like, you know, four, eight, 16, 32 of these things, okay? That's not how you do fractal stuff, okay? I won't even bother finishing this. I'll keep the patch out there so that you can see it that I made with this, okay? Um, I am not going to code this one. I'm going to bring this one up because it, you need to see the whole structure of it, I think, um, before you really get a sense of what's happening here, okay? And this is fractal A3. Okay, so here, the outline is the same. My microphone, see the little thing coming into the RTC mix? The left, the right channel with the delayed signals coming out. But look at the code here. Okay, first of all, this time I actually put up a sort of cheat of what the parameters for the Del1 instrument are. And everything here 
is about the same except for this thing, n levels equal three. That's critical because what I'm gonna do is I am going to make an RTC mix function. It's gonna be called make delays. And make delays is gonna have these parameters. I'm gonna give it a delay signal in, an amp signal in, and I'm gonna pass in the level number. Once I get that information, I go ahead and I do my delay generation where I say, you know, do it with that amount of delay and with that amount of amp on the delay. Now, here's why I'm making this function. Once you define this function, basically everything in this will happen when I say make delays. Down here, notice that I say make delays. It'll do all that stuff. Here's the magic though. If the level is less than the number of levels I specify, it calls itself with these delays and amplitudes multiplied. So that's descending down like two, four, eight, 16, by virtue of this being called twice every time I call that once. And the trick that I have to make sure I do though is add one to the level each time because otherwise it'll go forever. And I have to determine what's gonna be the stopping point for these delays. So eventually it'll hit that delay thing and it'll go, oh, uh, level is no longer less than le N levels. So then I just return, nothing else happens, but you've already scheduled all of those nice delays as you've descended down this kind of recursive thing. I think this is really cool. This, uh, I, 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 uh, I worked a lot in a language called Lisp when I was uh, in my younger days. And the essence of Lisp is this kind of recursion. Some of you may have heard of the book called Gerdelescher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. Um, he was, he was real famous. He won the National Book Award back in like 1975 or something. And he felt that this was the essence of consciousness, was the ability to do recursive self-referential things like this. I'm not quite sure he won that argument, but uh, it's still pretty cool. It's very, very powerful. With this simple specification, I can take care of all of that bizarre typing I was doing in the other one. And it works. I'm going to play it for you. Hey, 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 hey. Here's my, Here's, my Here's, my Here's my shoe gun. Here's my shoe gun. That's pretty fun. <laughs> and again, that's the thing I wanted to show you. That's that's kind of the way of using fractals that uh, that kind of thinks outside the box. Because I'll be honest, most people when they think about fractal operations and how you're going to apply that in music, you don't do this. What you do is this. Okay, let me bring up my thing here. You say, all right, here's my range of pitches. I'm gonna divide that out. I'm gonna like make a pitch here. I'm gonna make a pitch here. Then I'm gonna divide that range here. I'll make a new pitch here. Then I'll make a new pitch here according to the range. And I'll make a new pitches here, 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 here. You know, and you, you kind of like divide down at the pitch and you get this unfolding kind of mountain of pitches. Okay, because you tend to, I think the, you know, somehow the pitch domain lends itself to a fractal approach. And in fact, I'm going to play you a piece right now um, that, uh, that was kind of famous back in the day by a guy named Charles Dodge. He's one of the pioneers of computer music. And um, let me find it. Where did the Dodge piece go? Where did it go? Hmm. Okay, I've got it in my... Uh, oh, shoot, I probably put it in some other directory. I've got it in my um, uh, iTunes, so I'm going to find it there, okay? Uh, let's go. Oh, yeah, that's where I put it, actually. Okay, let me close all this stuff and go to work. Go to... There it is, G16. Yeah. Okay. Let me play just a little bit of this, okay? Because it's actually a really lovely piece. This is done 
geez, back in like the late 1980s, I believe. Okay, here we go. Can you guys hear that? I'm going to link that in on the website so you'll be able to listen to the whole thing. And also some other pieces. There's a guy, a friend of mine in New York named Michael Gogans. I often have him come in and talk to the class about his, his work where he's done a lot of very elegant pieces by applying these fractal and chaotic techniques, you know, to the generation of sound. Um, anyhow. Yeah. Let me get rid of this for now. Oh no, I don't want to get rid of it. Yeah, I did for now. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I forgot to show you some more fractal stuff, I think. Yeah, this, yeah. The next thing I wanna talk about is a thing called the Mandelbro set, all right? And this is the guy who's considered the father of fractals, um, who basically kind of came up with the scheme and the concept for how they work is a guy named Benoit Mandelbro. He just died like a couple of years ago. Um, he was a researcher at IBM Watson Research Center. And he discovered this bizarre mathematical construction called the Mandelbrot set, okay? And that's what it looks like. These are different versions of it. I'm gonna show you what I mean by different versions. And this is the equation that generates it. So it's really, really simple. The thing that's tricky that you gotta realize is that this Z and that C, those are complex numbers. So they're basically numbers with two components, uh, a real component and an imaginary component. So that when you're squaring them, you're generating a, a pretty, a, a, a richer kind of multiplication than just two numbers multiplied by each other. The Mandelbrot set is defined by, um, oops, sorry about that, is defined by choosing a value of C and determining does the ultimate point stay inside this dark part or does it fly off into infinity? And the coloration that you see is basically determined by how fast it would fly off into infinity. And what's amazing is how incredibly complicated this set results in being. And they have these things called um, fractal microscopes, okay? So this is the basic outline of the Mandelbrot set. This is probably zero to three or something like that. And this shows you all the stuff in the dark basically stays in the set. Everything outside of it flies off. What you can do with this fractal microscope is choose a portion of it and zoom in on it. And look at the boundary of where I zoomed in. You know, it's not just a straightforward kind of weirdly crooked thing. His uh, Mandelbrot's famous question is how long is the coastline of Britain? And he's saying it depends on how small your measuring device is. Because as you get smaller, you start getting all the nooks and crannies that you missed. And this Manabro set is an example of that. I mean, you know, I'm going way down deep. And the deeper I go, the richer this continues to be. So there's all these bizarre areas of the Mandelbrot set, which uh, you can actually find the entire Mandelbrot set within the Mandelbrot set. Okay, now this is as low as this uh, particular um, application is gonna let me go. But again, I'll have these on the webpage that you can kind of link in. And I wanted to show you that because uh, again, it's been a real source of, um, uh, inspiration. The Profiles piece by Charles Dodge actually draws upon the Mandelbrot set, not just a simple divide down procedure that I showed you. But the coolest sort of sonification of the Mandelbrot set was done by a friend of mine named Nick Didkovsky. Um, and he, uh, it used to run in web browsers, but it doesn't anymore. And I got in touch with him last week and he made a standalone app and I'll be putting this or a link to this on, on the webpage. And what he does is basically 
sonifies the process of deciding if something is in the Mandelbrot set. So there's his Mandelbrot set. If I choose a point, and these are all the different ways of sonifying it. So we can do simple sine and just hear sine waves. If I choose a point, you're going to hear it as it iterates in the Mandelbrot set. You guys hearing that? Okay, so if I choose one out here, there's where it goes to infinity, okay? If I choose one in here, it's, go it's going to take it a while. I think it's in the set, but I'm not sure, okay? And then I can add stuff like this, you know, an FM pair. I can do this. Ring boy, I can kind of add these guys out here. Forest ringer, whatever the heck that is. Okay, so it's a really, really cool concept of how to think about, you know, sonification here. You know, to not just, you know, say, oh, here's a set of numbers from the Mandelbrot set, I'll turn it into sound, but to actually sonify the process of deciding if a point is in the Mandelbrot set or not. So kind of cool. Again, I'll put the, the link to this. It's kind of fun to play with. Uh, you can, he used to do little concerts where he would play this, you know, and then he'd stop the oldest one and get kind of changing in time. Uh, Nick's a fun guy. Also an amazing guitarist. Anyhow. Okay. Uh, where are we now? Mandel Micro. Yeah. Mandel Music. I think I've gone through all the web pages I need to. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, we're actually doing okay. Um, like I said, I had three areas I wanted to cover. The last one is Markov chains. And Markov chains have had kind of an illustrious history in music, thanks specifically to good old Giannis Zanakis. Okay. Um, his whole sort of work with stochastics and probabilistic theories relied heavily upon Markov chain constructions um, in order to kind of enable his music to unfold in the way that he wanted it to unfold. And this piece, uh, Rebounds for Percussion Solo, is one of the purest kind of Markov chain pieces of Zanakis that I can find. Um, let me just play you a little bit. Uh, actually, do you want, do you want to learn? Do you, you guys, yeah, I should tell you what a Markov chain is before I play the piece. Yeah, let me, let me, let me kind of get you at that, okay? Um, Markov chain is very simple. Basically, it's probabilities that depend on probabilities that came before it. And there's a really cool um, kind of visualization of that, okay? Essentially, this is a, 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 it's called a state machine. You have two states here, okay? And you basically make a decision. If a certain random value is a certain, within a certain range, you go to that state. If it falls outside the range, you go to that state, and then you can repeat it up here with this state. So basically, see how this little ball is going? It's, it's repeating, but it's, it's not an imitative repeat. It's not a, a, a kind of like a, a real simple, it's not, a, it's not a, um, a straightforward kind of like repeat, because it depends on the probabilities of these different states. And these are the chains that are being generated as it hits each state and basically throwing these random dice and saying the dice is less than something, come back to the state. If it's greater than something, go to the other state. So you wind up with these really interestingly and suggestive sort of sequences of states. And that's what Zanakis liked, you know, and that's what he was doing in this piece. I'll play a little bit of it now. And you'll hear the drums are going to unfold. They're unfolding according to these probabilities of if this event had happened, then this event could happen. And if that event had happened, then probably this event or this event could happen. So he creates these very dense kind of chains of dependencies. Yeah. Uh, somebody had a comment? Did I hear something? Okay. All right. So here we go. I'll play a little bit of this. Okay.
run ahead a little bit, and it gets more complicated. So essentially all those things evolved out of that kind of changing state pattern. You know, there's something almost Steve Reichian about it, but Zanakis did it first. And uh, it actually isn't like Steve Reich at all. <laughs> so uh, yeah, th I, this is actually one of my favorite pieces by Zanakis. I like, a, I love a lot of his stuff, you know, uh, metastasis, oh, physiopracta, you know, all that good stuff. Anyhow, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to this, of course, on the website too. I thought, well, heck, this is kind of fun. Why don't we make a Markov chain drum machine? All right. So, and I can use this also to demonstrate, you know, how you can deal with sampling. So I made a bass drum sample. Okay, here's what it sounds like. You guys hear it? Play it again. Did you hear that? Okay, good. All right. How did I make the bass drum? Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, basically I just fired up uh, Audacity. And all I did was basically take this tap. Oh, wow, I got my voice there too. So basically that's my bass drum hit right there. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. Let me zoom in on that. And I got this. Okay. Sounds pretty crappy. Uh, what I did then, though, was I went in here and I went into my um, uh, graphic EQ and I just took these guys and said, whoa, this is going to be a bass drum. Okay, let me flatten this out. Okay, so I'll goose all those up like that. Um, Brad, you need to switch the audio device. Oh, for the, uh, for the, um, how oh, 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 I think. I will, I will. Okay. I'm just doing this real quick. Okay, let's take this out and, okay, let me apply this. So basically I applied that. Okay, and then I go here. Oh, it's not letting me do it. Huh. I think it's by the speaker. Um... Oh yeah, 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 I was looking through the wrong thing. There we go, sorry, there we go. So now it sounds like this which isn't a bad bass drum, okay? So, you know, I was like, you know, quick and dirty bass drum sample thing. So I got my bass drum sample. Okay, don't save it. All right, how do I get that into my max patch? Okay, well, let's bring it up. And I'll, of course, bring in my RT Scenics tilde, and we'll just make it mono. This is gonna be a mono drum machine. Okay, and we'll play this here, okay. Easy hey, Mac. Dad, I don't know if uh, everyone heard that while you were in Audacity. I know I didn't hear it at all. Okay. It's not that important. Basically, it went from like the sound of a tap on a microphone to something that was going boom like that. Okay. Um, I just, I just kind of threw that in. I wasn't even planning to show it to just to say, you know, here's what fun you can have, you know, just messing with sound. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, take my, take my word for it. It was like the best bass drum sound ever. It just, you know, it just made me want to get up and start dancing disco dances. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. If I, if I am going to plan to show you stuff, I'll make sure and check it out and, and bring it in. But yeah, it's cool. So how do I get that in? Well, there's two ways. One way is to read the sound file directly. But the problem with that is that it requires a specific path on your computer to find that sound file. Now, Max MSP has a way of getting those paths, but it's kind of complicated, but there's actually a better way to do it, okay? I'm gonna save it, okay? And I'm gonna save it, I'm gonna call this Markov, I'll call this mdrum1, okay? Now, notice, let will say that, that mdrum1 here, is in the same directory as bdrum.wave. That's where my bass drum sample is. What that allows me to do is take advantage of the max MSP buffer tilde object, where I can give it the name that I want this to have. I'll call it bdrum. And I'll call, then you give it the name, was it bdrum or bdrum1? Bdrum, yeah. Then you give it the name 
of the file in that directory where your patch is. I mean, people who know Max MSP know this. For me, it was like, you know, wow, that's pretty cool. So I double click on it. There's my bass drum hit right there. Now here's the fun thing you can do. You can actually access that from inside RT Scenix. And you do it by saying RT input again, but instead of saying audio, you say MM buff for max MSP buffer. And then you give it the name of that buffer. Well, it could be in quotes. That I gave it up here, B drum, okay? And finally, you want to take, I forgot the name of this message, uh, control. Buff set. I have a message that says buff set B drum. That says RT Scenix, I've got a buffer named B drum. And RT Scenix says, oh, that's cool. So in my script, I can reference it by saying MM buff with the name B drum. And just to make sure we're playing it, I'm going to use an instrument that's very handy called stereo, which I give it the input and the output. No, I should have made this a two-channel RTC mix anyhow. Let me, uh, let me do this, okay? Hold on a minute. Okay. okay, input, output, amplitude. Again, we're just multiplying what's coming in. And then how much of the input channel of that buffer do you want to go into the left and the right, okay? Zero go to the left, one will go to the right, 0 0.5 will go to the middle. That's where I want it. Oh, input, output, I forgot the duration. Uh, let's make the duration be only 0 0.2 because it's really short, okay? And now, let me change this. Okay, so now when I play this, no audio buffer is, oh, I have to make sure to hit that buff set message. See, otherwise I got this error here where it says no audio buffer is loaded with the name B drum. So I have to hit that. Ah, I now hit, now here, there it is. <laughs> Everybody else is doing that too. Oh, oh boy, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thanks for thanks for like jamming along. All right. So yeah, just wait. Now we're going to do our Markov thing. Okay. All right. So here's how we're going to do the Markov thing. How am I doing on time? Uh, let's. Um, I'll go ahead and code up the bass drummy thing. Okay, because that's not too difficult. And then I'm going to show you the snare drum after that. Okay. All right. First of all, I'm going to declare a variable called the beat. Okay, I'm going to be making it be 0 0.5. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do is just that. I'm going to put a. I'm going to put this at the start time of zero. That's going to be on the downbeat. Every time I hit the bang, it's going to go thump. Okay, now I'm going to use Markov chains for the second beat. Okay, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to throw random number dice, okay? I'm going to say if random is less than 0 0.5. So if I hit a random number that's less than 0 0.5, I'm going to add a second beat, okay? Now, I could just add a second beat. Let's do that first, okay? Um, put this in here. And then now my start time is going to be at beat, okay? That's all, okay? This is... I wouldn't even call this a Markov chain. It's just kind of like a, a random kind of addition. But now you'll hear as I play this, you know, put my drum here. Um, let me put in a metronome so I don't have to hit this like repeatedly myself because I don't have a good sense of rhythm. I'll say Metro 1000 because I want it to go every second because I'm going to generate two beats in there, um, one at time zero and one at time 0.5 which is 500. Again, max is kind of annoying because they use milliseconds and not like actual time. So a thousand is one second, okay? All right, so yeah, here we go.
Wow. Boy, we had quite a run there for a while, didn't we? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, by the way, last time I was telling you something. I don't know why it messed up. I think I must have mistyped something. But every time I start this, I will get a different sequence of random number generators. That's because by default, it will seed the random number generator with the value from the system clock. I can override that by saying SRAND, and I can give it a integer value, and it will always generate the same seed from that. But that will be a different random sequence than that, which would be different from that. But that's a good way to help debug this stuff. SRAND with no arguments does the same thing the default does. It just generates a number from the clock. So like this, it will always generate a different random number. OK, well, that's kind of stupid, you know, even though it's kind of fun. Well, it's stupidly fun. All right. But I want to do something more. I'm going to say now here, if we're actually in this second state where we're going to put in a second beat, I'm going to say if random there is less than 0 0.5, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, I'm going to put in a second beat. Copy that. And I'll make this be at time beat. Okay. And then I'm going to do more. I'm going to say, if I've generated a second beat, then I'm going to have a certain random probability of generating even more. Okay. I'm just popular. I'm just happy with 0 0.5. So there, what I'm going to do is generate a beat halfway between that first beat and that second beat. So this has a 0.25 uh, not 0.25. Multiply the probabilities together, and you can see this has like a 0.125 of generating uh, boom, 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 like that in between. Okay, But the fun isn't going to stop there. I'll also say if random less than 0 0.5 here. So this is independent of this. This depends on it generating that second beat. That's the Markov chain aspect. This is independent. This one is independent of this one because it's a completely separate random decision. Okay, And we're going to say that this is going to be equal to OK. We're going to say beat plus beat divided by 2. OK, a uh, little programming thing here. If I want to be sure it's going to do the division first, which I do, I don't want it to be beat plus beat and then divided by two. I want it to be this beat plus another half a beat to get it on the other side of that second beat. You can do it by parenthesizing that off. It will guarantee that it will do that before it does the addition. But by default, it always does multiplication and division before it does addition and subtraction. OK, so that will do kind of what I want it. But you know, just because I'm a, maybe a sort of an obsessive compulsive guy, I'll do that. So basically, I generate a beat. I have a 50% probability of generating a second beat in that one second pass. Now, given that second beat, I have a 50% probability of generating a beat, a half a beat before that, or generating a beat and generating a beat, a half a beat after that. OK, so all of a sudden now, this has become a bit more complicated. So now we play it and we can hear, oops, unexpected dollar end. I forgot to probably, let's see, ah, I see. I forgot a open bracket. I have to close that off. All your brackets have to match. This is the joy of programming. OK, and finally, that one closes off with that one. OK, now we should hear just amazing drums. Woo! Yeah, just 
just amazing drums. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to make it a little better. Uh, I'm going to add a snare. Okay. Let me close this guy off. And here's my snare drum sample that I generated. Same way, tapping on the microphone, doing some weird filtering to it. Uh, I think I shifted the pitch a little bit at one point, and I got this sound. Guys hear that? Yeah, pretty remarkable snare. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, that's just going to take over the techno world, I can tell. Okay. All right. And instead, this one is a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to type it out by hand. I think you get the essence of what's going on. Uh, let me bring up the snare Markov thing. I believe it was this one. Yes. So there's my snare drum. Notice I'm doing that same buffer operation, and I'm going to set the buffer there. And here is the Markov chain thing for that. Okay. A bit more complicated. Okay. So I'm going to add a snare on the second beat. So it's always going to start a beat. Now I have a 50% chance of generating a snare hit preceding that beat. But given that 50% chance, I have a 30% chance of generating it the half a beat beforehand. Or I have a 30% chance here if it's less than six. And that means this is the other part of it. These both have to be true. And if it's greater than 0.3, so I have a 30% chance here. If the dice is between 0 and 0 0.3, it'll do that. If it's between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6, it'll do this. And look at the clever thing I did. I divided the beat into four beats. So it'll go beat, 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 right? Oh, but if it doesn't satisfy any of those conditions, if it's not less than 0.3, if it's not less than 0.6 and greater than 0.3, which means it's between 0.6 and 1.0, it generates a triplet. Whoa, this is a snare drummer par excellence. And the fun doesn't stop there. That was all preceding the second beat. It also has a 50% possibility of doing something following the second beat. And notice that's because I'm adding beat onto each one of those. So it can go a half a beat after the second beat. It can go a quarter, two quarters, three quarters after the second beat, or it can do this triplet after the second beat, All right? So again, now we're getting into more Zanakian type things where you get these very complicated patterns, you know? And, you know, it's not that complicated, but the essence of Markov chaining is this if a probability, else if a probability, else a probability, because then you can map out these uh, kind of different chains of state that can follow the probabilities. Something has to happen and have a certain probability before something else can happen with a certain probability. That's what a Markov chain is. And here's what this guy sounds like, okay? Oh, 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 wait, no, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. Uh, I forgot, I caught a bug. Notice that I have my metronome set for 500. Remember, it's generating a whole, uh, it's generating zero and then a half a second. It's generating a whole second worth of sound, okay? I thought that guy was going a little bit berserk, okay? This is a, uh, yeah, I forgot to save this. Sorry about that. I did it on the last one. But here's what it's supposed to sound like, okay? which sounds kind of dopey by itself, okay? All right, let me play now both of them together. Okay, so I got my buff set B drum for that RTC mix, buff set S drum for that RTC mix, they're both being controlled by the metronome, which is in fact set to a thousand, initialize them, and here's what it sounds like. I was hoping the bass drum would pick up a little bit there. <laughs> 
Yeah. But all of a sudden, you know, you can start having fun with this, you know, go in and start messing with the probabilities and, uh, you know, coming out with uh, different things. Um, tell you what, I'm going to play you just the very first 30 or uh, just a 30 second excerpt or something from a piece that I did way back in 1985, where I took this exact same approach, but I did one thing different that I want to mention. Okay. Let me find here. Where's my stuff? Brad music. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's called approximate rhythms. Okay. And I'm going to start it out here. I'm going to run ahead a little bit. Okay. So again, all those drum beats are being generated by Markov chains. Okay. The thing that I did differently that I wanted to mention though is to make it sound a little bit better. I know the sound is a little quiet. Unfortunately, there's a DC bias in that sound file that at some point I got to get rid of. Um, you know, this is kind of annoying because it's always playing the exact same, you know, oh my God, stop it, please. You know, um, unless you're really into a particular brand of techno music, you know, this just drives you crazy after a while. What I did was basically for every drum hit, of a particular type of drum I did, I sampled 10 drum hits. And I had my algorithm randomly choose one of the 10 because each one, even though it was the same drum and the same hit, each one was slightly different in sound. And I was thinking about doing that for this and I thought, well, that's just too much because that's not the point of this particular class or anything like that. Um, but there's little tricks you can do, you know, slightly altering the start time with an IRAND of maybe up to like maybe uh, five hundredths of a second, you know, delay or something like this, you know, all of a sudden it doesn't have to sound exactly so mechanistic. Um, you, you choosing from a set of bass drummy hits or something like this, you know, it won't have that drum machine like mechanicness to it. Again, maybe that's something you like. Personally, I like music a little more organic because I'm old and I'm from the 1970s. So that's the way it is. All righty. Uh, now, um, there's things that we didn't cover, okay? And I want to take, we just got about 10 minutes left here, and I want to I show you just a few of those um, because they'll be linked in to that, um, uh, to, to the class webpage. You know, when you go to, say, uh, which one do I want to go to? Fall 2015. Uh, uh, hold on, guys. I got to try and find out where this is, okay? Because this is the one that I blitzed out, unfortunately, okay? Fall 2015. I'm going to go here, okay? Right. Um, Week six. For example, very closely related to um, fractals are things called L systems. Uh, Luc Dubois, his dissertation, um, in fact, we've got the dissertation linked in here. I think these links may be broken, though. I've got to check them. This is from an older class, um, was about L systems. L systems are a way of kind of doing a fractal division that generates these very suggestive plant like forms. So basically, you go up and then you make a decision about which direction you're going to plot, and then you go up from there. Um, and you can wind up with, you know, very kind of elegant sort of um, uh, plant forms. In fact, they were, the, the Lindenmeyer, the guy who's named after L systems or Lindenmeyer systems, his specific goal was to try to model plant uh, growth and morphology. And he came up with this way of doing it. So you can kind of take a look at that. There's another fun sort of thing that you can look at. Um, go back out here. Uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Yeah. This is one of the first kind of real demonstrations of kind of the power of computers to do these things. They're called Boyds. And this guy named Craig Reynolds, this is from the 1987 
um, special interest group in computer graphics or SIGGRAPH convention where he unveiled this. And it was like, oh man, it's not, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is a video of it, okay? And even though it's the graphics are just insanely like 1980, um, look at the patterns of how these things are kind of flying. There you go. I mean, basically nobody had seen anything quite like it. And it turns out that it's a really simple way of kind of defining movement where you're constantly just adjusting yourself according to your nearest neighbor. And you have like a tendency to go in one direction. With those two simple rules, you generate things like this. Okay, I don't think this one is interactive. Some of them you can actually like guide them around. I think, oh, look, I'm making more boids. Oh, look, they're gonna crash. Ah, wow, that's cool. Okay, so again, very kind of suggestive. This is this is done using a um, a program called Blender. It has animation capabilities. It's a very high end kind of modeling program. So you get these really kind of elegant kind of things, and you know it, it basically imitates flocking behavior very well. Um, they use this in all kinds of Hollywood applications now. The first big one that people remember was uh, I don't know if you saw one of the early Batman movies where penguins were like marching. Uh, somehow the penguin had gotten like all these penguins to do things. Well, they were basically just animations controlled by this void algorithm. So that's pretty cool. And there's one other one that I wanted to show you. Um, that's a lot of fun called cellular automata. Okay. And these are basically kind of abstractions of the Boyd's idea where essentially you have, it's called a cellular automata. You have these little cells and each one looks around at its neighbors and decides what it's going to do next. The most famous one is John Conway's Game of Life. Sadly, Conway passed away earlier this year. Um, he was an amazing mathematician. Um, and he kind of came up with this thing. Basically, it's a, basically, they change their color depending on the sum of the colors around them very simple rules and you get these really like evocative kind of evolving forms you know i can like add more sort of green cells it'll turn to blue cells you know and conway even proved that you can imitate a full turing machine compliant computer using these very simple kind of rules um some of the more some of the more fun ones are uh yeah these are I'll scroll this down yeah, here's Conway's Game of Life, Cyclic Cellular Tomo. This isn't the one I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you this one. And this shows you the code that was used to generate them, okay? Yeah, this is the one that I like a lot. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's up here, this is important to us living out on the West Coast these days. Forest fire. It's basically, it's a imitation of very simple rules for the spread of, say, a fire-like substance. And you can see that, you know, obviously they're not raking their leaves, by golly. It's a shame. Anyhow, so those links are there. Cellular automata, they're, they're trickier to think about in terms of how you're going to use them sonically, but uh, they are very suggestive. Hey, so I got through the class. Things didn't break this time, and I hope that uh, this stuff was interesting to you. Like I said, the intention here is to kind of show you how you can do some of this and um, kind of take it from there. And if you get really involved in some of these things, um, you know, and you'd like to try out, you know, say you go to that uh, Paul Burke page and you see his equation, how the heck am I going to turn that into something in RTC mix? Um, that's something that we can help with, you know, and uh, yeah, now we're going to go into, you know, kind of the next stage. Uh, well, Doug's going to be talking next week about RTC mix stuff. And then we're going to, you know, start looking at some higher end machine learning stuff and eventually start getting around to the web-based uh, implementation of this stuff. Okay. Uh, hope it was good. Uh, any addition, any final questions or anything like that from anybody? Zoom is so weird because this silence is so profound. You know, when I, when I, when I say, are there any questions? All I hear is like,
and it's just blank. <laughs> so maybe I'll just have you turn on all your microphones so I can hear you going or something like that. Anyhow. All righty. Uh, so next time, uh, Doug Scott show will happen and we will make sure it happens this time. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. All right, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your week. Um, I hope uh, things continue to go well. Again, if you're having troubles, you know, for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks Say goodbye. Thanks. All right. Hey, owner, why don't you hang out for a bit? Let's just talk briefly. Okay. So bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Oh, guys. <laughs> I hope that was okay, Ben. <laughs> I hope I didn't like. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I say, <laughs> say more about what Leaf meant by parameterization is just, he was just exploring the behavior without really doing the physics. Yeah. So kind of. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the that's fun thing yeah. you can do with this stuff, though. You know, yeah. you don't you don't have to become like a physicist. You can just like go, oh, let's yeah, try this. <laughs> like Boyd's is the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All righty. See you guys. around. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Oh, wait. Owner? Yeah.